You have to move with it, actually. And the Lord said. All right, are we recording already? Okay. This is our second beginning. The first one was futile. But we shall now begin and with much uh, clamor. <laughs> All right. Genesis chapter 12. We're going to reread verse 8 and 9 and then comment a little bit on that. We already pretty much shared on that. But <clears throat> finish that off and then move on uh, further. Uh, beginning with verse 8. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east side of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. And so <clears throat> we were reminded of the altars that are constantly going up. Um, and that, that Abraham or Abram's relationship with God um, is, is based upon altars, or you could say it's built on altars. It's built on altars being built, not just a theme of altars, but actual altars <clears throat> that, um, uh, that are representative of the Lord and of things that are in his heart. And notice that he built the altar first and then he called upon the name of the Lord. A lot of times the cross is a latter thing that we think about, it's not the forefront. And it's, it's forefront when we think there are subjects that call for it. Um, but um, of course, we're talking about Christ and him crucified and there is no just Christ. There's, Paul said, God forbid that I uh, know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. Uh, I'm determined not to know anything among you but Christ and him crucified. He didn't say Christ and he didn't say the cross. And I will tell you, and most of you probably know, there are people who preach Christ but they don't preach the cross. And there are people who preach the cross and they don't preach Christ crucified. They, make, they put it on you as if you are the one who has to bring about the crucifixion when Jesus did that. We have to, yes, we have to acknowledge it. We have to um, <clears throat> um, reckon on it. We have to, in different forms relating to different things, take it up daily. But all that being said and all that information known by many of you still doesn't take away from the fact that he built the altar first and then he called upon the Lord. Doesn't take away from that. I see the, the other can be information. It can be uh, things that we've learned, things that we've gotten, but, it, but we've got it. It hadn't got us yet. You know, it hadn't, it hadn't taken over us. And, and that's our endeavor. That's what we're seeking to do. We want the Lord. We want him as he is and um, and as he is will and at least the man that God used to write most of the New Testament will include the cross for an abundant of reasons some that we showed the negative ones in our first class uh, we uh, hope to get around to and I'm sure we will get around to the positive reasons the things that are so joyous and thankful for the cross. <clears throat> um, and usually our reaction is, um, uh, you know, I, Lord, I love you and I want to be with you, but uh, I'm not sure about this cross thing or something, you know, something like that. And, and that's understandable except most of the time we don't really understand. We have our own concept in our mind of what that means, and that's so common. That goes back to your salvation, and somebody says, well, take up the cross and follow Jesus, and you go, what does that mean? <laughs> you know, am I gonna have to give up, you know, my music, you know? Apple 
streaming music or something. <clears throat> and uh, so, you know, he's, uh, Apple streaming music wasn't even around when he, <laughs> Jesus said, take up the cross. So <clears throat> it has more to do with uh, not so much Apple streaming, but streaming Adam through our, <laughs> our minds and our souls and our attitudes, the old nature, the nature of Adam. Mm -hmm. Um, so, but, but I want you to notice, um, because he did, he did this regularly, but he, he grows because right here it says, um, that he's between Bethel and Ai, which is house of God and ruin. And so he does build an altar right after those words and there he built it an altar but he doesn't take either path. In other words, someone may, may look at ruin and say, I need that, I need, I, need, I need all the areas that are not him to be ruined. I need him to be brought down. I want the Lord, I seek the Lord. I don't wanna, I don't wanna live the way in, the, in a box of religion that people put me, I want the real God and I want him now and I want the heart. Uh, of him, um, and but the other side would be Bethel, the house of God. Well, let's you know, because again, remember, he doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't have a map. He doesn't have Google God. He just has. He just has either the leading of the Lord or he's discovering the land, and so he doesn't know for sure what what that is and what this is. But he, it, you notice that right after that, though, it says, and Abram, so he builds an altar, and he calls upon the name of the Lord, but he keeps on germ, journeying south, and um, journeying south very shortly here, when we read the next couple of verses, is going to end him up in Egypt. He's going to end up in G Egypt. And Israel has a long history of being wrapped up in Egypt when they shouldn't be. <clears throat> okay, so, um, so the question is, is it possible to, <clears throat> to believe that the altar should be first so you build it, you be, believe the cross should be first so you, you, as much as you know you set it forth and you know you should call upon the name of the Lord in, in, a, in really everything, but not, again, not for direction for should I pick this up or not. We're not talking about that. We're talking about what is his decision. I was thinking about that recently when I was talking about <clears throat> our decisions and, um, you know, that the thought came to me in relationship to our voting for president, whoever that is. Uh, and we usually pick the things that 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 person stands for in relationship to us, and that's our choice. But we see too many times, like in the book of Esther, how Haman was, was exalted and how um, Nebuchadnezzar was exalted and uh, story after story. And if we don't know the Lord rightly, we may pick the wrong, the wrong one. We may pick our, and I'm not even talking about president. I'm, t I'm talking about the way that we relate the who we choose for this or that or whatever. Um, we may pick and, and we'll usually pick our choice, our choice. This is my, well, this is, this is, the reason why I use the president thing is this, this is our choice. I'm an American. I have the right to choose. Well, okay, you're an American, you're an American, and you have a right to choose. But if you're, if you're a believer and if you're submitted unto the Lord in the way that he desires, then your heart should immediately go and say, what do you cho choose? And you, need, you have to say that without any bias, without saying, you know, well, I really like this one. Will you go with this? <laughs> Instead, what is your choice? Who is the one you want? Who is, what is that? Okay, so you say, oh, all right. Um, there have been years that, that we've picked 
really bad presidents, you know. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, there's some guys back there that in history that. <clears throat> but what if the Lord wanted them at, at such a time as this, you know? What if the Lord knows exactly what we need? What if we don't always need blessing? What if we don't always need everything perfect? What if, what if He is intentionally um, bringing things into our lives? to challenge us more in his nature and more to allow Christ out of us, um, which what would that call for? Well, that would call for making decisions that maybe go against what you like. You know what I mean? Because, okay, so just a picture of this room or people that are on Skype. Okay, let's go with this room. Okay, if everybody in this room in this church did exactly what they wanted, <laughs> it would be bad. You know, there has to be uniformity of mind, and that mind has to be Christ's mind. Um, is, are we perfect at that? I don't think so, but I don't think anybody is. Uh, I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about the heart. I'm talking about the first thing that comes up is the altar, then calling on the Lord, and then trying to get an answer. And that... that you know, it doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it didn't make sense to Mordecai in the book of Esther. It doesn't make sense. Um, of course it doesn't make sense. It's not, you know, our sense. It's not our, you know, well, if I was God, I would do this and that. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm so glad you're not God. I'm just, you know. <laughs> Right, perfect, yeah. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, and what did, what did uh, Samuel do before he started looking at the sons? Sacrifice. He built an altar. <laughs> well, he did. I mean, that's, you know, well, well, this is weird. No, no, this is, this is the way it is. Samuel from, I mean, we can go all the way back to Samuel when he was a young boy and back to his mom, Hannah, and that whole story. And we find that, that, um, Eli was the high priest, and his sons were horrible, horrible, horrible. But, but God didn't immediately grab somebody that was an adult and bring them in and overthrow them. God found somebody and worked with them to see if they would stay in tune with his heart, which was Samuel, and, to, uh, and see, you know, um, if there would be this process of altars and finding the Lord's heart through the altar first instead of just you know well this seems like a good idea or whatever and I mean I you know I've done that bunches in my life I, tr I would hope I'm not as susceptible to that now I don't think I am but the, the, the deal is is that it's you know of course we would fall in that category where we would not always you know go through the altar first but that's part of what the Lord's trying to get us to do is try is to uh, get us more focused on his his reality and him as a reality above our world. OK, so, you know, um, well, I don't like this. Well, I don't like that. Well, I wish that was different. I, OK, I know I know all about that. But particularly as a, a leader on any level, not just on any level, if you are molding the things that you're over after your own image, 
you're totally missing the point. It, there, is no, it, it, there is no ministry. It's not ministry. It's man. <laughs> it becomes ministry when it is ministering on behalf of the Lord and by the Lord and through the altar. And that's, that's, where, that's where it starts. So, you know, and I've often used the story of, of David when, when the Philistines came out to fight and David said, uh, okay, you know, bring the ephod here. And he prayed, and Lord, what should I do? And the Lord said, do it this way. And he went, okay. And he did it that way and defeated the enemy. And then the next day, the same enemy came out again and he, it's a, it's a perfect example. It's not just, pr it's not just called pray twice. <laughs> it's called double check with his heart right now. And if all we ever got out of me sharing that or finding it in the Bible is pray twice, then we really missed it. You know, go back. I want your heart. Has it changed in any way on this front? Because if it has, I'm going to change with you. I just want to go with you. Okay. So does it always work out again for a victory like David and the Philistines? No, it doesn't. Um, uh, the, right here at this story right here, it's got in between Bethel and Ai. And um, I mean, you got two different stories. You got Israel. When they first got, came out of Egypt, made the trek for 40 years, they enter into the land, and one of the pl first places they go to is Ai, which was a small town to take it, and they got defeated. And God allowed it. They had been winning everything, you know, all along the way. Jericho, the walls fell, and all this. So they we're winning, we're winning. It's all about winning. And God brings them down because it's not all about winning. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> losing is important too you know and uh, you know I won't go into my little pet peeve over children that only play sports and everybody gets a trophy and stuff I think it's important to learn to lose <laughs> and to lose in a right spirit you know <laughs> but that's just me you can you don't that's not in the Bible you don't have to go with that one. <laughs> but the spirit of that is in the Bible, and that is, um, is, is that, that thing that God can work in you when you fail. Um, David, in, that, in uh, Psalm 51, when he, when he failed, his heart broke, and he went after the Lord. You should just read it. And it was like, it was just poured out. It was like a soul poured out before the Lord. And it was because he loved the Lord. And his, he, he, was, he was a man whose heart was after God. But does that mean that that heart every time does exactly the right thing? No, it doesn't. But it means when it doesn't, it strikes you deep. It strikes you deep. David, when he found Saul in the cave and his Saul was trying to kill him and he found him in there and he didn't kill him but he he just did a simple thing cut off part of his his garment and left just to show the king I was in there and I could have killed you but I didn't but instead of him going yeah this is great you see that you see that it's it smote his heart that smote his heart. I mean, you know, we're, we're looking for big, you know, blunders and sins and this and that. And, oh, I failed and all this stuff. God can, he's real good at forgiving because Jesus already died and covered all sin. All you got to do is ask for forgiveness. Can I get an amen? amen? I mean, if that wasn't true, then every time someone sinned, Jesus would have to go back on the cross and die for that sin. <laughs> he's got it all covered. So what's he most concerned with? Our heart. And our, how we are uh, oriented to that heart, in our heart. And, um, you know, Bethel's another one where, where um, Jacob was running for his life because of some stuff that had gone wrong, but, but it actually was the Lord. And he gets to Bethel. And there you, you see what's termed Jacob's Ladder. And he, 
he laid down and rested his head on a rock because he was, you know, running from the circumstances of what had happened. And, and he wakes up and sees these angels of God ascending and descending on this ladder. And he says, surely the Lord was in this place and I knew it not. That we need to have that happen to us more often. We, very few places do we say, surely the Lord is in this, especially if we don't like it. Surely the Lord is in this. No, no, God ain't in this. You know, I know I don't like it. <laughs> well, that's not, that's not correct. <laughs> that's not correct thinking. <laughs> um, The truth is we don't know. The truth is we just don't know. We don't know. This is God, our God is bigger than us. He's bigger than this earth. He's bigger than all this. And our, the best place we can be is just submitted to his heart. You know, people, people paint that a little differently. They say, well, he's Lord, and we're just his people, and we need to be submitted. You need to obey, you know. Uh, well, Okay, that's the law. <laughs> Even if it's not using commandments, it's the law because it's the spirit of the thing uh, that counts. And so instead of that, I want to be submitted to his heart whereby there's an open communication here, not a preconceived idea from my mind to his mind and I'm going, well, I don't know if this is God or not. You know, are you sure? Is there anybody else up there? You know, no. You know, it is heart to heart. It opens, things open up. The Lord touches you and you melt. I want that. I want that. I want him to be able to to mold me. I want, you know, I want, I want to be clay. I want him to be the potter, you know. But, but what are we thinking when we say, I want that? Are we thinking, uh, I'm, uh, I want to give up all my preconceived ideas so that he can bring me to what's in his heart? Or are we thinking, I don't know, somehow he's molding me and I'm the clay and I don't know how he's doing it and you're the potter, but I don't ever feel like I'm on the wheel <laughs> or something, you know. No, no. Um, and, and all of that comes from the heart. When the heart turns the Lord, to the Lord, the veil is rent, and I see his face. Not when the, when the mind grasps the terminology. Not when the mind has, has, has been able to put all of the pieces together and go, oh, I get this now. No, you don't get it yet. If you don't get it straight from his heart. But yes, we need the pieces. Yes, we need the scriptures. Yes, it's good. This is not bad. But we can't make this it. We make the Lord it. And this is a, a, a vehicle to get closer to him. But, but if we turn the vehicle into a a runaway train <laughs> that we're in charge of. It's like, okay, you get out of the, you're no longer the conductor. You know? <clears throat> so, so Abraham journeyed still toward the south. He's heading, he's heading toward Egypt. He's heading down there. Now, kind of like with the story of Esther and Mordecai, I'm sure that we're going to say, oh, this is going to be a good trip because when he comes out of there, he's going to be richer than when he went in. Okay, well, it's going to be a good trip, not because of the riches, but because of the failures. Because there's better riches. There are better riches. Hallelujah. All right, so... We, so we saw that initially Abraham is coming into the land and he brings Lot, right? He's bringing Lot um, and, he's, and you can say it like this. He's bringing Lot with him. God didn't say bring Lot, remember? He said leave your family, leave all of that. He didn't say bring Lot, but he's bringing Lot with him into the land into the land, all right? 
And he's doing that because he's thinking this, you know, I wrote down, he's doing this because he may be thinking this is the heir. No, you better believe he's thinking Lot is the heir. This is the heir. He's going, this guy is going to be the firstborn that God wants to use to bring forth the lion through this family. Can you imagine if Lot actually became, you know, was put in that place, though he was not that, what the lineage of Israel would be? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. So what is Abram thinking? What is he thinking? He is thinking in terms of, okay, it's like this. There are subjects that God has that are important. Firstborn, many seed, <laughs> um, uh, fulfill the promise, stuff like that. So he's thinking that, and he's going, okay, firstborn. Let's see, Sarah is barren, and I'm an old guy. So Sarah, barren Sarah and old guy equals zero. <laughs> <laughs> we got we got zero working here, all right. So I conclude from the way that the Lord has laid this out, the only possible seed will be Lot, because his father died in the Ur of Chaldees, and. He seems to be the rightful heir, and he's young, and he's the only son that we've got because Nahor is still back there, and we have no contact with that. This, this all makes sense, but not to God. But it does. It all makes sense. Okay, so uh, Mordecai is the greatest man in the book of Esther because he's so, you know, just... You, you know, we're all just better off erasing all of the garbage that we put in there that we think is the answer and just get on our knees in our face and say, I want to know you. I want your, you know, the clarity comes with your word. Peace comes even if you don't like the, the, there's always questions, well, what will this lead to? You know what I mean? I mean, there's always stuff. There's, we're... We're that way. You, you, you grow with time, you grow, and you don't worry about that anymore because you just go, Lord, you're Lord, that's all I want. If this goes really bad, I don't care. I'm with you. I will be with you. I will not complain about how this works out. I, because why? Why? Because he's wanting the spirit of his son. And we're wanting... Well, that chair should be over here, and this thing should be there, and you know, you see what I mean? That's 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 what we're wanting. We're we're wanting the set of, the setting to be um, the way I like it. Okay. Well, God, in one sense, could care less about the setting, except that He wants to make sure that there are plenty of things that you you know, fail with so that you can go, hmm, maybe I was wrong. I really thought that was the Lord. You know what I'm saying? Um, or, or I failed, but it was not the failing in this situation or the failing to reach that end that I had in my mind. I failed to be with you, to give you your son, no matter what. I failed to be a, a, an altar and a, and a burnt sacrifice inside is, the, is my heart that is having the lamb on it. And I just want to be there with you. And I want you to, you to receive that sweet savor of Christ. Well, who's going to see that or, you know, you go, well, how do I adjust my, you know, how do I adjust my life um, to the setting? I mean, it means way more to us than it does to him, the setting. What matters to him is Jesus. So, 
So Abram's got Lot, and he is convinced this is going to be the one. This is, and when we say the firstborn, we're referring to Christ, who is the firstborn. In type and shadow, he's saying Lot is the seed, which is Christ. Okay. And it just, it just makes perfect sense. And it is just perfectly wrong. And it is just not, has not really listened and pursued the heart of the Lord. Although the Lord, the Lord is going to give us reasons to, to get off. And Abraham's a perfect picture of that. So, um, so Abram's thinking, you know, I'm responsible for Lot. That's my brother's son. You know, when, when you, somebody, you know, your brother, when he, if he died, you were responsible under the law to marry his wife also in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. Okay, so your brother dies and he's got a son. You feel responsible to take care of that son. Okay, so I have to do this. This is the right way of doing it. This kid's an orphan. Um, and he, but he's also the only line, so I'm going to fulfill my responsibility. There is this thing that God throws this wrench in there, and it's really something because God, at this stage and not for a while, mentions that the seed's going to come through Sarah. Doesn't mention it. If he had mentioned it, we wouldn't have thought a lot. I mean, this is me talking now. I go, Lord, if you'd have mentioned it, <laughs> I wouldn't have even looked in the direction of Lot. There's no way that could have come from there. So why are you doing this stuff? It seems like you're messing with me. And the more we're going to look here, we're going to see. I mean, it really, he does. It, it, it is a form of messing with us because, you know, I'm going, just give me a clear explanation and I'll be with you. But He's still trying to get us to press past clear explanations so that we can. What was it? What was it? I was, was it last night when so and so happened? Then what was that? A scripture somewhere anyway. I, uh, we, I think I was talking about it last night. Um, when this happened, then he went as probably Abraham. But anyway. Um, the word when signifying when I heard this, then I did this. Well, it's not about hearing. You can hear all this stuff and it sounds right. But we haven't, how can I put this? There is a relationship with him that he doesn't have to explain it himself. He doesn't have to explain everything. I am with you. I'm not going to assume anything until you make the full story complete. I can think about maybe Lot, but I am not assuming that because you haven't really made that plain. And I know me, and I know that I will, I will assume stuff, and I will just go with it. And I'll go, well, this, well I mean, my God, this, there's no other way. Barren, you know, Sarah's barren, and this is it. So, and he's... And then when he then when he finally says, "Oh, through Sarah," later, much later, we go. Why didn't you say that? Well, this whole time I'm off on a rabbit trail because you wouldn't be clear. <laughs> so what are we saying? The Lord is not trying to be clear. He's trying to be who he is, and he's trying to get us, he's trying to get that spirit and nature formed in us. But that, that urge to get answers is what gets us in trouble. It's an urge that drives us. Well, I gotta, I gotta know. I mean, I, you know, you've heard me say, well, I can't just stand here and, and wait. Like waiting on God isn't, is doing nothing. No, waiting on God is saying, I will not move until I know what's in his heart, not just find a scripture that will just, yeah, praise God, this scripture tells me, you know. Can I tell you this? Jesus wasn't scriptural. 
He was the living word of God. Jesus didn't go, well, let me see, what does the book say? You know, he had the life of it. He was, was the life of it. And we're not just supposed to go by the scripture. We're supposed to, yes, search the scripture. Yes, I want you to. But you're not going by the scripture. You're looking for the living word there. And that's your pursuit. So I wrote down, uh, God spoke of seed, but remember when he came, when Abraham first came into the land and he finally spoke and made an altar? God spoke of seed, but there was no mention of Sarah. And then I wrote, part of the reason for this conclusion may rest upon the fact that when God spoke to Abram about his seed, there was no mention of Sarah being the mother. And that's verse 7. God could have mentioned it if he desired, but to not do so causes Abram to look around for other options. We don't have to look for other options. Can, you know, can we say, well, in your timing? You know, and you've heard me talk about the will of God. There's the will of God, but that's not the only thing. Most people are just going, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? And they get the will of God, and then they run. Okay, There's the will of God. There's the timing of God. And that's in conjunction with the will of God. And then there's doing it in the spirit of the Lord. All three of those are what he's looking for. But we, we you know, much of the teaching nowadays just says the will of God. We'll just find the will of God, you know. Okay. Well, you're going to have a seed. Lot, get over here. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I mean, it's a, it's a foregone gone conclusion if... We're just trying to fit something in as the answer. Is this the answer that God has? Or is this me looking and having to have an answer and looking at what is available at this moment? What's available at this moment? All right, well, maybe the thing isn't hadn't even shown up yet <laughs> you know so he can't point it out and in this case he could have he could have said that but I think there's times that 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 thing hasn't it hasn't been brought forth yet it hasn't the timing isn't there and it's not there yet because you know I I don't see it therefore I'm sorry I keep doing this, but y'all see how important this is. Therefore, I look around. Um, so, um, and then I mentioned that uh, concerning Sarah, all the while she faced with every special appearance of God to her husband, she had to bear the reproach of her own barrenness. So that was really, really hard on her. You know, so we're, we're up to this point, we've been talking about Abram and about his relationship with the Lord and him trying to find the Lord and him to, wanting to be with the Lord and, and, and in an attempt, you know, I think that he was sincere when he said, Lot, this has got to be it. I, I think he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong, and that's, the, that's where you get off. But Sarah is in a completely different situation. She's barren, so in her mind, there is no way it's going to be me. And every time God appears to my husband and tells him there's going to be a seed and all this kind of stuff, it just strikes me to the core. All right. Now, how many of you know that she did bring forth the seed? Raise your hand. All right. How many of you know that if you're barren and you hadn't brought it forth yet, that you could bring forth the seed. Praise God. But that doesn't change the agony that she's going through. And, and her husband comes back and says, I just spent time with the Lord. <laughs> it, was, it was really good. You know? Yeah, I mean, it, it was like life inside of me. And she's going, just shut up. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. <laughs> However, she doesn't have to be contrary to that. You understand? She doesn't. Um, you don't have to know. You don't have to know how it's going to work 
But if your mind is set on either it can happen because it's impossible for me or, um, oh, what was the other thought? That it will, oh, that it, if it's going to happen another way, like Hagar coming on the scene or something, if it's going to happen another way, I don't know that I can take that. Don't you think that you have to be willing to be with the Lord in whatever he chooses? I mean, all, you'd lay all the options on the table. And you go, Lord, you're, you don't even have to pick any of these. You probably have answers that I've never even thought of. Um, but I want to settle some things in my heart. If you choose this option, here's the way I want to be. And I want to line up with you. If you choose this one, I really don't like that one, but you know what? I want your will, and if you choose to bring forth that seed without me, then bless the person that you're going to bring it forth in, and may they grow and flourish and bring forth a multitude of, of the seed of Christ. Amen? Amen? We have to settle these things. I mean, we don't, we don't have to, and... And many times maybe we don't. Maybe we don't even think of it. Maybe we're not even open. But why would we not be open? And that is because we've let our hearts get, get hard, a little harder than they should have. And so now it's like, no, I only want your will of God if it's this. The other way is, no, none of those. It has to be me. What is that saying? It has to be me. No, it doesn't have to be you. It doesn't have to be me. It doesn't. It has to be the one that the Lord wants. And it has to come the way the Lord wants it. And the Lord's going to allow. And we know, see, the, we, we know the story. So the Lord's going to allow a Hagar to come along. Well, she's not going to bring forth the seed, is she? She's not. But Sarah doesn't know that because she's still barren. I'm jumping ahead here. But... You get you got to you got to see this the process even up early on. This is all factors that are being factored into this, and the way that they're thinking and the way that they're acting, and it's moving them in directions that they don't. They're they're just grabbing at straws, you know. So you learn to to mold your life in a way that says. Look, Father, I don't know. I really don't know. You know, y'all have heard me say I'm a blind man. I, I don't say I'm blind anymore. I used to say, well, I'm blind. But usually what that meant is I'm blind, but then the Lord opens my eyes to see it, and now I'm not blind. I'm blind all the time unless I see by his eyes and his heart. I'm just blind. I am blind, blind, blind. But somehow, through his eyes and his heart, I can see, but it doesn't change my blindness. I'm just blind. So what do I have? If I believe that, if I really took that into me, what would be my prayer then? Lord, I, it would always be, I don't know. I don't see. I don't get it. But I got you. <laughs> and I'm with you. And however you want to do it, and whatever part you want to show me right now, then I'm with you on that because I have no ability to see because I'm a blind man. And the end result of that is, you know, don't you remember John 9 where he was talking to the blind man? Wasn't it there? <laughs> you know. And at the end, Jesus, I mean, Jesus heals the guy, and at the end he says to the Pharisees who are griping about Jesus healing on the Sabbath, he says, because you say you see, then are you blind? But if you're blind, then you will see. Um, Christianity, a lot of it has to do with um, everybody sort of in a contest of grow, we're all growing. We're all growing. How fast are you growing? Oh, oh no, no. I got to, <laughs> you know. Instead of all of that, how about y'all go ahead? I'm just going to sit here and say, Lord, help me. Amen. Help me. Um, I had a picture. A thing happened to me, and the Lord gave me a picture of it 
back when I was in Bible school. It's in my early 20s. And, um, and I was in that, that uh, competitive thing. And it was a Bible school. And we had quite a few students. And, uh, and it's like Paul used it like we're all, you know, out distancing. Well, I wasn't out distancing. It was like people were passing me. You know, it's like, I'm, I'm going with all my heart. You know, and then somebody goes, hmm? what? And they go, this is my second time past you. You know? <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just felt like that. And I was like, I in deep inside, I had found life. I had found the Lord. I had, I knew this was the answer. This was the best thing that had ever happened to me to find Jesus. And yet, everyone else seemed to be getting it. You know how that is. Everyone else is getting it. And I'm not. <clears throat> and... Um, and the, so the Lord gave me a picture because this is kind of the way that it happened. He gave me a picture and all of us are standing on, on this great big old ocean, <clears throat> body of water. <clears throat> and the Lord says, uh, the Lord's sitting in a little rowboat over there. He goes, ready, set, go. And everybody jumps in and they're, swimming him because we're trying to get across and he's swimming man yeah and some of these guys are really trained swimmers are, you know they don't make a wave they're you know like dolphins or something you know shooting through and others just are going past and you know and I'm watching everybody going past me and, and Jesus had rowed out to a distance there and they and it, it, we're all supposed to get to Jesus you know so we're going we're gonna get to Jesus and, and I'm, I'm, I'm so tired Gosh, and I don't see anybody else kind of going flopping, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm coming, Lord. You know? and, and, uh, and then I, after a while, it looks like, man, I, I can see them all the way up there, and I'm back here. And then all of a sudden, Jesus rose up and says, hop in. I said, Jesus. <laughs> I got in the boat, and he went, and... He just paddled right past all the swimmers, you know, and they're all going, what's, what's he doing in the boat? You know, didn't earn it. Didn't earn it. Didn't deserve it. And he just opened his heart. And, you know, that's what I saw was his heart. And I saw that it wasn't about all the information that makes you faster in this kind of race that it was about the, the race that counted to his heart. I want to know you. I want to I want to stay with this until it's so real in me that that it is you, like Paul said, not I but Christ. And I know that. I don't I don't have to fool myself and say, well, it's Christ, even though I'm you know a horrible person and I, you know. You know, I don't even keep my sheep's clothing up to, you know, <laughs> clean and stuff, you know, like I should, you know. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I just want us to know that Jesus, and I want us to know him that way. I really do. I just want us to know that Jesus. And, and you know, that, the scriptures doesn't say, well, when, uh, when, Randy dies, <laughs> then you'll get it. Or when, you know, uh, the weather changes or da-da-da-da, uh, or, or if the circumstance changes, it says when the heart turns to the Lord. Amen. When the heart turns to the Lord. The heart, the heart, the heart, the heart. Because, see, we can have a lot of ambition in there saying, oh, I want you, Lord, I want you, Lord. You know what I'm saying? That can be a lot of ambition, and that's, that's not the same thing. We can say this ambition is my heart turning to the Lord, and he would say to you or me, no, that's not it. And you wonder why you haven't seen my face and been changed from glory to glory. That's why, because you're calling this, that, and this, that, and and you haven't found out what I call it. So it just brings you to that 
place where you you are willing to lay down this and that and you're willing to okay i don't want to be the champion anymore the champion swimmer i'll never be that i'm a blind man i can't do this i really can't i know i can't i don't say i can't but i keep trying <laughs> you know, i'm i'm truly unable and I have tried, you know, and the thing that got me, the thing that broke my heart before Jesus pulled up in the boat was, was that I was trying with all my might. I thought I was really, you know, I mean, I'm really trying. And I'm going, golly, I'm so tired. I don't think I can go. And I, and I remember just like crying, thinking, I have failed you, Jesus. I totally failed you. I'm, I'm the worst out of all of us and and you know and it wasn't just being the worst that bothered me it was that i really didn't want to fail the lord i have found the best thing that had ever happened to me and then he pulls up and <laughs> says get in the boat <laughs> you know there was there wasn't a look on my face going yeah we'll show them suckers <laughs> you know there wasn't none of that in there there was only thank you lord Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I don't want to get out of the boat. I want to be with you. I want to be with you where you're at. And if you stayed back here close to the shore and they're going, yeah, look at us, I would stay with Jesus back close to the shore. I'd just stay there with him. So, um, so we're talking about Sarah. The road that God has for Sarah and, and Abraham um, is not an easy one. It will seem as if every time that God promises them something wonderful, that it immediately he allows things that seem to move in an opposite direction. And um, a little more on this big, big picture thing, and, and what I mean is this, that God didn't give Abram the full picture from the very beginning. And he won't give it to you. You have to walk with him and you have to wait with him. I mean, we're all willing to walk with him, amen? <laughs> but we have to wait with him too, you know, or run with him. Oh, yeah, I really like running. <laughs> you know, well, praise God, when it's time to run, run, you know. <laughs> but it is, but the whole point is, I, you know, I don't want to run if you're back here. I just want to be with you. <clears throat> so there is this, uh, th this big picture that will be developed over time and will literally not end until, well, the end. I'm not, you kind of know the end, don't you? But maybe you don't really know the end yet. Um, he is... He is giving us as much as we can handle without ruining us, either getting prideful or destroying us or something like that. He's feeding us if we're hungry. If we're not or if we're too busy or we just got our own thing going, that's another story. But if we're, we're genuinely trying to be with him, he will slowly open the big picture to us, but it'll only be in parts. So that's... That's what I'm referring to here. Um, the Lord seems to be slow in giving forth the full story as seen in the big picture, which causes suspicion and confusion concerning what God's, God has in mind. And that it did, right? I mean, that whole thing of choosing Lot wouldn't have happened if he'd have said, it's going to come through Sarah right from the beginning. And again... We don't look at God and say, well, this is your fault. We look at our hearts and say, I should have not assumed anything. Not my assuming comes out of me, and that's, that's garbage. That's not him. And it's, it's, oh, it may be the greatest wisdom in the world that can, you know, write new medicine and make, you know, do stuff like that. But it's garbage in light of his plan and his heart and how he wants to do it. You see what I'm saying? So I'm not de denigrating us in that sense and saying we're garbage, although Paul said we're worse than that. He called us, you know, dumb. Um, 
So let me finish this. So it causes confusion. Uh, for example, when God promises a blessing, it seems that curses come. And this is going to be what we're going to discover in, uh, in Genesis 12 um, and verse 10, but we're not going to get there quite yet. Uh, let me read one more paragraph, although I don't have anyone following me up tonight to share. Um, I put a little subtitle here. It says, Curses Don't Void Blessings. You know, thorns on a rose thing does not void out all the roses. Can I put it like that? You know, we go, there's thorns there. This, this can't be God. <laughs> you know, no, this is your God. This is your God. Well, the devil made roses. <laughs> Speaking of Valentine's Day. Um, no. No. God knows what he's doing. And if the th rose is worth it to you, you might get pricked. It might, you might even bleed. But the question is, is it worth it? And maybe to the way the Lord is, just the fragrance of it is worth it. What if, what if he wasn't looking for a great work done what if he's just looking for a fragrance to satisfy him the sweet fragrance of christ what if that was it what if all the ministries had no fragrance to him but just that lamb spirit that laid itself on the altar and let the fires bring forth that fragrance that couldn't happen when the lamb's just walking around it happens there, and the lamb knows it, and the lamb goes, this is where I belong. This is because I want the Father pleased, ultimately. I want, and what if it, I mean, you know, I know that Jesus' work on the cross accomplished so much for us, but what if, from the Father's perspective, the only thing he got out of it personally was that sweet fragrance of that rose? You see what I'm saying? But they, you had to go through a lot of thorns to get to it. So, um, curses don't void blessings. I wrote, however, Abram is yet to realize that the curses do not void out the blessings. They are still blessings. So I guess I wrote all this out here. I didn't know, I didn't remember this. But like a rose, they are surrounded with thorns. We do not doubt a rose is a rose just because we have been stuck by a thorn. Right? But we must also realize that God's faithfulness is not based on us, but his son. That fact will bring stability in the face of what happens to take a negative turn. All right. So a negative turn, at least in our minds, a negative turn says... This is, this is going nowhere, or this is going bad. Um, but we have to be with the Lord in the negative turns, or we're just jumping in and out. You know what I mean? It's like the Lord's going here, and we're, we're picking places to jump in, and I'm with the Lord now. Whoop, I'm out. You know, you know what I'm saying? And we... Hey, there's that. <laughs> I've learned to appreciate your mind <laughs> because I think we're similar in our weird thinking. <clears throat> However, don't confuse that with the mind of Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and I haven't. <laughs> enough of me God I hope you got something out of it <clears throat> you know the Lord is faithful the Lord is he's just wanting us he's wanting our heart and he's wanting but he's not just wanting us us he's wanting us empty so that he can fill us with his son we are a vessel of honor if we're filled with the son we are a, a vessel of whatever the, the negative was if we're if we're empty if we were devoid of the son we can be filled with Christianity and religion and 
and even memorize scriptures and not really be walking with him in heart together because there's nothing more important to us than Jesus and being with him regardless of where he takes. It, yea, though I walk. Yea, though I go through the valley of shadow of death. The one thing I got going for me is you are with me or you could even say I am with you in it. I didn't turn back when we got here. Go through the whole path. Father, and we love you. We, we need more of your spirit to overshadow us like, like the spirit overshadowed Mary to, to bring forth the seed in her. And Father, we want that. We want that. that. We don't want Mary, the mother of Jesus, to have great wisdom and knowledge. You didn't want it. You wanted her to have the seed of Christ to grow and develop inside of her until she brought him forth in manifestation to the world. And that's what you want, us manifesting Christ ultimately to the world. And so, Father, we ask you to continue to shut down our, our great thinking minds that seem to have so much uh, understanding and wisdom and direction and to, to just become as a little child and say, take my hand, I'm with you. I don't care where we go. I want to be with you. Father, we ask you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen.